There's been a lot of bombing, left, right, and above, um, everywhere. It would be a lie to say that I'm not afraid, because this is a one-way ticket. I know I'm going there for a good reason, and if I don't see my family, my friends, and the people I love here on this earth again, I have faith that I will meet them after death. In Ukraine, it's not just Ukrainians who are fighting. Thousands of people from abroad have joined the battle. Who are they? And why are they doing it? If I'm needed to help my comrades at the front line, I'll go there. If I'm needed to take care of civilians, I'll do that. Whatever job the Legion gives me, I'll do it. Capon, as he calls himself, is from Latin America. For security reasons, we don't disclose his exact location. He's preparing to leave his home. Capon tells me he works as a paramedic. He seems to have plenty of friends. Overall, his life seems pretty normal to me. He's one of several people I get in touch with on social media. Here, people who want to join the Ukrainian army connect from around the globe. Quite a few people who say they are already there post about it, but a lot of what they post is hard to verify. In our first online encounter, Capon doesn't reveal his identity yet. He wants to join the army as a combat medic. I saw these terrible images of how they attacked civilian zones with missiles, people dying in their apartments, and attacks against humanitarian corridors. I saw so many terrible images of suffering civilians, including children. And it broke my heart to see them. And as a paramedic, I have the skills to help them. I know I have something to offer. The 19-year-old tells me he still lives with his parents. He prefers not to share pictures of his family, though. They don't agree with what I'm doing. The day before yesterday, my grandmother was crying. They're afraid, and I understand. I'm not going on a holiday. I'm going to a country at war and will risk my life to help other people. He says his father even offered him money to stay. But a few days later, it's time to leave. His friends throw a farewell party. He sends me videos from his journey. It's the first time that he is going abroad. He doesn't come from a rich family. The mother of a friend chips in to pay for the flight. In return, he has to promise to come back alive. Sandra from Norway has already joined the Ukrainian army. They refer me to her. The life she depicts on social media is not for the faint of heart. She used to be a fisher, then served as a representative for her ethnic group, the Sami people. She tells me that after that she trained as a combat medic. Now she says she's on the front lines. First of all, it's the moral obligation. Uh, this is home base, it's in Europe. Uh, um, we owe them, so if you can help, you should. She tells me what her days are like. You can't really prepare because you don't know what's going to happen. There might be an airstrike and it might be artillery and it might be relocating. Um, so you, you just have to run by it day by day. On her social media account, she poses with weapons. She tells me she has no qualms about using her gun. 
well, it is what it is. It's your job. It's what you have to do. So um, it's the one who's, who fires first. That's how it goes. We're not the attackers. We are the defenders. We are not the one crossing any borders. They did. Kapon flies to Krakow in Poland, close to the Ukrainian border. Temperatures in Eastern Europe just have dipped to near freezing, a climate that Kapon has never experienced before. I join him for the next leg of his journey. The first stop, a military shop. He still needs a bulletproof vest, since he isn't sure whether the army provides one. You have a body armor? No. But another este, body armor you have? No. Uh, five, five pound 11? No, no, no. We don't have. All right. The military shops in Krakow are overrun right now. What are you going to do? Well, apparently it's difficult to find body armor in Krakow, so I have to go without and hope that I don't get shot at. Isn't that a suicide mission? A bit. It would be good to have one, but even with a vest, the bullets come through, so the only thing I can do is hope to come back in one piece. By chance, Capon meets other men who also want to join the battle. Oh, we go today. Ah, uh, today already. Oh, uh, medic? Yes, paramedic. To me, he makes a dubious impression. Killer. Eh? Killer. Killer. Ah. <laughs> Killer. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the man doesn't want to be filmed but claims he fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, working for a private military contractor. (laughs) Capon has no combat experience, so he decides to train on a shooting range. He's now joined by a man from Colombia who goes by Tato. They met online in a group of Spanish-speaking volunteers. They also test an AK-47, which is used in Ukraine. The training at the shooting range is intended for civilians and is supposed to be just for fun. It's just the second time that Capon has ever held a gun, he tells me. After half an hour, he's done. It doesn't prepare me for war as such. But at least I know how to handle a weapon correctly that I might use in Ukraine. For people like Capon, the International Legion is their main port of call in Ukraine. On Instagram, it advertises itself as an adventurous, heroic group of comrades. It was founded just days after the war started and is believed to have around 20,000 members. I've come here to fight, fight the Russians and defend democracy and freedom. According to the Legion, they are paid the equivalent of Ukrainian soldiers of their rank, sometimes less than 500 euros a month. Their contract lasts until the war is over. Their spokesperson tells me that people who want to join have to pass several tests in Ukraine. As a rule, they are sent to some of the hottest um, spots uh, on the front line and are taken care in some very... uh, let's say, delicate, uh, offensive and defensive operation. Can you prove that you don't use them as cannon fodder? Well, I think it's very difficult for anyone to prove anything uh, in this war. Uh, What I can say is that uh, we can give all public and private assurances that no one in the army is interested in sending people to the front who are not ready. The Russian government sees the international fighters as mercenaries which could result in worse treatment if they are captured. I ask an expert for his take on it. They are not mercenaries. It's not a a company, it's not a commercial entity which is sending those fighters there. There is quite a difference. And uh, as long as they are integrated into the forces of the host country, they are not mercenaries. 
Is this phenomena of international fighters that we see right now in Ukraine, is this something new or has this always been present also during other kinds of conflicts? Well, it's not new, of course. We've seen this in, 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 in Afghanistan, in Iraq and other Middle Eastern countries. But um, to make the distinction clear, when those uh, Islamist fighters joined an insurgency, it's completely different from joining the ranks of an existing country, joining the forces, uh, the legal, legitimate government forces. In Poland, I meet a German fighter who tells me he has been in Ukraine for two weeks. Poland seems to be a jumping off point for foreign volunteers. In total, I talk to seven of them on and offline. Much of what they say is hard to verify. Some of the men don't appear credible. Their mental or social conditions appear unstable. A man from Estonia who claims he's at the front suddenly ends our contact, which worries me. I'm not sure what happened to him. I joined Capon and Tato on their way to the border. The International Legion officially only accepts people with live combat experience, but they give it a try anyway. Tato at least served for eight years in the Colombian military, he says. Recently, he was working in Spain but lost his job. For him, The war is also a career opportunity. Why am I taking this risk? Poof. I often ask myself that and don't have an answer. I think it's also the excitement, the adrenaline. It's a chance to prove myself. I think about it constantly and feel nervous. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't afraid. But with this fear comes adrenaline. Time for the last voice messages. I want you to know that everything's okay. I love you. I'll send you a message when I can. After death, I think God will judge us for what we did in life, whether it was good or bad. I'm grateful to my family that they introduced me to Catholicism. My faith gives me hope and it keeps me safe. I know that I'm going there for a good reason. And if I don't see my family and my friends and the people I love here on this earth again, I hope I will meet them after death. The man who sits next to them is from Ukraine. That's your family? Yes, my family. They're still in Ukraine. He's going to the border to get his mother and bring her to safety. His brother and cousin are at the front, he tells me. So what does he think of the foreign fighters? Yes, he's do a good job for the peace in the world and peace in Ukraine. Because we cannot stop this war ourselves. We need to help. To the border is from her. Most people are going the opposite direction. More than five million Ukrainians have left their country so far. I'm really cold and a bit nervous. Now that I see the people here, the volunteers, the soldiers, the families crossing the border, I'm even more motivated and excited than I was before. Does he really think he can change anything? I'm not Rambo, nothing special. But each grain of sand helps. And if I just save the life of a few fighters or people who need me, I'll have made a difference.
they want to join the Legion the next day. My journey with them ends here, but they promise to stay in touch. I head back to Germany. I'm still in contact with several people on their way to the International Legion. Some of them turn around the last minute. And I receive sad news. The man from Estonia, who said he was at the front and then stopped communicating with me, is no longer alive. His brother tells me he returned home, but then killed himself. He appeared to be mentally unstable. Shortly before his suicide, he apparently watched video clips of the war. Sandra, who has been at the front for quite some time, is still there and determined to stay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there's been a lot of bombing left, right and above. Um, everywhere. Um, so you get used to that too. Uh, the human brain is, is wired to just um, get used to whatever situation you have to get used to. Uh, and I know that sounds f***ed up and weird, but uh, you can get used to anything, including bombing. When do you think will you be back home? I will be back when this uh, war is over. When there's no more need for me here, then I will go home. Capon seems to have a bit of a roller coaster ride. The International Legion at first rejects him and several others. But 10 days later, he tells me, the Legion suddenly did accept him. He writes, I'm happy, and sends me a picture of the body armor he was given. On Instagram, he posts, you are the only one who can make all of your dreams come true. Besides paramedic tasks, he tells me, he's now also receiving regular combat training to be able to defend himself. In a few days, he could be sent to the front. We agree that for security reasons, this will be our last interview. They will train me for combat with real ammunition, everything, as if I was a real fighter. <laughs> Have you thought about leaving? You do think about it when you hear detonations, when you're close to exploding grenades, when you hear sirens and are in the cold for hours wearing just a sweater. Also, I haven't showered in a week since there's no bathroom, so you do start to think. Has your view of this war changed? Yes. I realized it's even worse than what you see on the news. Everything is worse, because you're the main target. It's quite ugly. It's a strange feeling to say goodbye. And I hope he will make it back home in one piece.